Hello, hello. Uh, welcome to the fifth and final episode of Common Unity. We're here with our very, very special guest, none other than Chaos himself. How's it going, everyone? Really happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Lewis. Yeah, of course. Thank you for coming on. Um, you know, uh, Chaos has been around for a little bit. Um, he's kind of started his own parties. Um, he's kind of built a name up for himself um, from the ground up. And it's been something pretty admirable to see. But you, you know, you you grew up here, right? Um, a little further north, right? Would you grow up exactly? So um, I was born in, here in Miami, actually. Uh -huh. uh, I was raised in North Miami till I was probably um, eight or nine. And then uh, I moved to, to Broward. So I've been living in, in West, like Miramar, Pembroke Pines area uh, up until now. Nice. So you've always been kind of like a Broward, Miami kind of guy? Yeah, for the most part. <laughs> kind of traveling before between the two. Um, but you you grew up here, right? And I'm sure that you were kind of exposed to a lot of like different um, music and sound and stuff like that. What was kind of like the soundtrack that you had going on when you were like a little kid growing up? So just to give you some context, um, for a majority of my life, I grew up uh, living in a household with in North Miami with, with my mom, mm -hmm. uh, my aunt, and my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And um, like my first exposure, I would say, to anything music related was, was the radio. They always had mm -hmm. the radio on at home. And um, that's kind of what, you know, was my beginning, uh, I would say, like exposure to anything like music related. It was a lot of uh, like, Salsa, bachata, yeah. like very like what you would imagine in, in, a, in a predominantly, you know, Hispanic uh, household, he, like just whatever was on the radio, but it, it was good, you know, uh, like background music and kind of piqued my interest into to wanting to like listen to music as, as a hobby or, or mm -hmm. having it around. Yeah. Was there anything in specific that like your parent, like your mom or your aunt or your grandmother would throw on? Um... For the most part, it was mostly the radio. Yeah. I, I will say that uh, my mom had a, a bit of a like a CD collection. Nice. So I do remember, um, you know, when we would go on, on drives together, uh, mm -hmm. she would sometimes put on her CDs and she would show me like what she had in her car. Oh. And I could literally name like the two like CDs that like we would listen to and I, I still remember them from now it was like one of them was like a deluxe kind of like greatest hits of the Bee Gees oh nice and then the other one uh, was a CD from Los Serenitos Verdes uh -huh. and like the one song that I just to this day I still listen to is uh, Lamento Boliviano uh huh yeah so, you always throw it on so from there like <laughs> you know thinking like I would say oh wow I mean kind of like the you know, my first step into like saying, oh, I like this type of music and it's kind of resonated with some of the music I play now mm -hmm. that's more um, funkier and, and more like old school. But those are the first two like concrete albums and songs I could remember that like from from that time period yeah. in my life. And you're also Bolivian, no? That's your background? Yeah. So my m mother and father, they're from Bolivia. Nice. And you've, you've gotten, uh, you go every now and then back there, right? Yeah, um, I was born here uh, a few years when I was very young. I spent there back and forth, and um, I used to visit every year or so. Um, I haven't gone since uh, 2022, but mm -hmm. I'm, you know, here and there, I'm, I'm trying to go more often. Not too bad, yeah. And so you had, like, this, um, this specific kind of music. Well, you had, like, a lot of, like, Latin and a little bit of disco growing up, I could tell. Um, but then what was kind of like the first song, not song, like first music that you kind of discovered on your own, you know? Um, I would say like closer to, I guess being in middle school okay. is when like, or I could pinpoint the actual time frame. Like, I think uh, I got an iPod touch. Nice. Like if, and, and when I was in like, I don't know, like I think fifth grade going uh -huh. into middle school. And that's when like, you know, uh, LimeWire was around, yeah. like, I got to kind of download all of my own music and explore, like, really what, what I wanted to listen to and have, like, an actual device that would, you know, have all my music in it, basically. Mm -hmm. But 
um, I would say in middle school, like one of the first like I guess digs I found mm -hmm. um, or that I really enjoyed was uh, Joy Badass's uh, mixtape 1999. Fire. Like that's probably you know in the list of albums I listened to like from start to finish with no skips. That's yeah. that's there, and and that was my my main genre I would say for a good period of my you know like you know growing up like middle school and high school was was mostly like uh rap hip hop but more centered mm -hmm. around like the, the the chiller beats like I really fell in love with with the the instrumentals and like the production like that's mm -hmm. what I kind of um would admire and mm -hmm. all the music I would listen to I'd just say oh wow like I mean obviously the artist themselves is doing a good job rapping over them but yeah I really appreciated like the the production and like the samples they were using and the the beats behind it yeah I mean honestly I feel like specific for like um hip-hop and like rap and stuff like that I feel like the production is kind of like it's always a top notch especially like that that album specifically 1999 like those like you said, like those samples and those beats are like, you know, like second to none. Those are like very unique um, kind of like beats that uh, I feel like in most um, other genres, you can't really find anything like that. Like the way they chop and the way they produce is just like, yeah, it's like it's crazy. But I mean, that's pretty cool. I love that you were like, um, like very from a young age, like already kind of leaning towards like the production side of stuff. Um, like that's that's pretty unique, I feel like. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I, I have, I haven't really uh, started producing any of my own music, but mm -hmm. I do appreciate all you know everyone that that does it because yeah. um, it's it's a big I think you know stepping stone and, and having your own sound out there is amazing and there's yeah. so many artists from Miami that I could say have really you know put Miami on the map. Yeah, yeah, but, it's uh, really cool to see how many like uh, unique producers there are, and I'm sure you'll be added to that list very soon. Yeah, um, man, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, you will. You will. Uh, but so that's pretty cool. So you were like in, in middle school, and I'm guessing high school as well. You're kind of like hip hop oriented for the most part. Uh, for the beginning, uh, then then I kind of got into more of uh, delving into like alternative music mm -hmm. and um, like I, at that time, like when I was in high school, I would have. I think I remember listening to a lot of uh, Father John Misty. Nice. Uh, Mac DeMarco with uh -huh. Tame Impala, I, you know, I had had that uh, kind of influence. Yeah, uh, I remember the first actual concert I went to Ooh. was, I want to say it was either 2015 or 2016. Okay, and I saw Beach House. Ooh, whoa! At, at um, Revolution Live in Fort Damn. Lauderdale, and oh, dude, I still remember that concert. You know, I. I don't think I cried, but you know their music is really like, man, you just want to you know, be yeah. there and cry. I must have been, you know, like, you know, like, you know, like really like I experienced the concert like to its fullest, and from there I was hooked and on going to like live events and that whole aspect of like you know going and seeing your favorite artist live. Yeah, um, I think it started then. Damn, that's a really cool like first artist to see. That's a very unique one, because like like you said, yeah, it's definitely like it's like kind of music that'll like make you. Make you cry, you know, for the most part. Um, but damn, that's a pretty, that's a pretty cool first artist, honestly. And what were kind of some of the ones that followed up in terms of live uh, sets that you saw? Um, let me see. Beach House was the first concert. Mm -hmm. um, I remember after that, I saw Playboy Cardi nice. for Art Basel at Club Heart. Whoa! And I don't think it's around. That anymore. was that was probably the craziest cars I've ever been to because I think Playboy Cardi was probably like an hour to two hours late and like <laughs> yeah, everyone is there late. like you know it's a small venue everyone will, been waiting there listening to the openers yeah and um I was in the front of the crowd okay um and I, I remember him coming out playing I think it was what like one of his, yeah. his songs and like him like just emptying two water bottles into the <laughs> crowd and like I got splash of water um, I would say that was a good memorable like concert slash event I've been to in uh, I went to. Yeah. Um, after that, one of my favorites, um, I saw Father John Misty live. Oh wow! Uh, I don't remember the year. I think it was maybe 19 or 18. Mm -hmm. But he played uh, in 
what do you call it? He played at the Fillmore. Oh, nice. And he was accompanied by like a live orchestra. Oh, whoa. So like, that was a tremendous like concert, you Damn. know, like he has such a good voice and like him just singing or, you know, playing his songs live was, I would say, better if like then like listening to to him on like Spotify or Apple yeah. Music. He has such a good voice. But then like accompanying that with like a live like band slash like orchestra, like mm -hmm. it sounded uh, tremendous. So that that's one of um one of the most like you know, I guess memorable concerts I've had. Um and then in twenty nineteen I went to New York by myself. Nice. Um I just you know, Bought a plane ticket, booked the hotel. <laughs> I was like, ah, I'm out for a weekend. Nice. Because uh, um, I got to see Freddie Gibbs and Mad Lib oh, shit. at uh, MoMA One for, for a, a concert they uh -huh. had. It was like them, um, and they were, I would say, Joey Badass and Mad Lib. Or Mad Lib himself is m top three producers in yeah. my eyes and artists. Like Agreed. everything he produces, in my opinion, is golden. And Agreed. all my favorite albums are, you know, he's, he's been part of them. Mm -hmm. um, and Freddie Gibbs, like, obviously, he's, he's a really talented rapper. And um, it was for, I think they performed, they performed a lot of Bandana and Pinata. Okay. Yeah. So it was, was about to say. a tremendous, like, uh, experience seeing them live. Yeah. I, I remember I got there, like, as soon as, like, the event started, I saw a bunch of different artists. Um, and... At that same, I guess, it, was, it wasn't really a festival, but there mm -hmm. was a lot of, like, there was, like, maybe 10 artists in the lineup. Mm -hmm. I, I had gone to see Freddie Gives a Mad Lib. Specific, but yeah. um, what was funny is, like, in that lineup, there's an artist, um, her name's Kelly Lee Owens. Okay. She's more electronic-based. Okay. And I remember she played earlier during, during the day, and I remember seeing her set, and mm -hmm. I was like, wow, this is crazy. Yeah. Like, she played very, like... I want to say a bit of like D Detroit style, like techno, and okay. she had her own sound. But that was one of the first exposures I would say I had to electronic music, mm -hmm. and um, I thought it was incredible. Like you know, later on, like I fell in love with that subgenre or that genre of music. Yeah. But um, that main event was to see Freddie Gibbs and Mad Lib. They killed it. I stayed till the end. I think they performed last. I stayed all the way till the end. Yeah. Um, was all the way in the front of the crowd. Oh, I, yeah. I got to actually like. You know, stick my hand down and like dap up Mad Lib. Oh yeah. Hand. So that was, I would say, yeah, probably top three um, concerts, such such events I've been uh, been to. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a very uh, transformative kind of event. I mean, obviously you had like Mad Lib and Freddie Gibbs, or you know, a duo that is like no other, especially right now in modern day. And you had the Kelly Lee Owens, which is definitely somebody I'm gonna go check out now because that sounds crazy. And that kind of like opened you up to electronic. And then you said more or less like a little later is when you started to take that, you know, you started to explore a little more. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like how you came to that? Um, yeah. So for the most part, I would say up until 2018, um, early 2019, you know, okay. I was heavily, you know, into like just finding new music. Mm -hmm. I, I really fell in love with like you know, exploring different labels or, or going through an artist's full like dis discography. Like, yeah. You know, I want to see like I want to listen to what they've the first things they've they've done. Yeah. I want to find similar artists. Yeah. And, um, what were some people like that you were doing that for around the time if you remember? Um, the first time I remember doing it was with Joy Badass. So okay, nice. I, I was exposed to 1999. Mm -hmm. um, then you know I, I learned more about like the group they were part of Pro Era. Mm -hmm. Is looking at all the artists that were part of that group, going yeah. through each of their um, their kind of individual tracks, like Nick Kosh and Capital Steez, R R yeah. um, R.I.P. And then like ended up you know, going through like different like blog posts and figuring out that uh, 1999 came out in 2012. Mm -hmm. In 2010, um, they made a mixtape called the the Yellow Album. Mm -hmm. Or yellow tape, I don't remember exactly. Yeah. But like I found that on like some probably very sketch website. <laughs> I downloaded it and listened to that and I was like very intrigued in the fact that like, you know, there's so much involved or so much that an artist offers and, and just seeing, you know, being able to dig and find more and more that maybe people haven't heard mm -hmm. is something that like that's 
the one memory I could pinpoint that um, I saw myself doing that. Yeah. Um, but then, like, moving on to, to my exposure or, or fascination with electronic music, mm -hmm. I would say in, in 2018, 20, early 2019, mm -hmm. I was, you know, seeing myself as someone that loved music, loved finding music, loved finding different artists, and I really loved sharing that. Like, okay. I remember telling, you know, whatever, like, some of my friends, that, you know, that, hey, you're going to love this, listen to this. Like, yeah. I'd, I'd figure out what what they like to listen to and I'd you know, give them recommendations and nice. I would f feel pretty happy when they said, oh man, like you put me onto a good song or yeah. like, like I would try to take over the ox at the, you know, the party and say, yeah. hey man, let me play some music. You guys are going yeah, yeah. to like this. Um, so I started thinking and I was like, man, like what, what's the next step into, into sharing music? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really uh, go into that production or like, you know, producing my own music, but mm -hmm. I figured, hey, like you know, DJing is probably the best outlet to to share music to you know to people. Mm -hmm. And then uh, back and forth, like 2019, I was like, oh, what do I do? Where do I start? Uh, do I buy like a controller? Like, what are the steps into doing this? And I yeah. think um, by the end of 2019, like I want to say either November or October, I actually bought a controller, and nice. and it was like a very simple one. Um, and I started, you know, learning like the, you know, DJing yeah. very simply, like oh, like EQing. Uh -huh. um, started actually like compiling all the the music I'd found. Mm -hmm. And um, around that same time period, uh, 2019 is when I got exposed to, to more of like the electronic music scene. Okay. Um, I remember the first time I went to Floyd, uh, it was with a friend of mine, and uh -huh. I think the person that was playing was uh, Will Clark. Nice. Okay. And I remember going like my first time being in Floyd, being in like that type of atmosphere. I was hooked. Nice. Like the the lighting, you know, the ambiance, the the different types of music that he was playing. Yeah. Um, Shout out Will Clark. He's a big inspiration as to why I wanted to do this. He's got his own podcast and stuff. But hell yeah. <laughs> um, but that's I think the first like, electronic artist I saw besides Kelly Lee Owens. Mm -hmm. um, I remember he played this one song, um, which I didn't know at that time what the name of the song was or the artist. Yeah. And uh, the f the friend I was with, he like I took a video, mm -hmm. and, and he actually DM'd Will Clark and said, "Hey man, like what's the song?" Nice. And and he responded. Oh wow! It was uh, a song by DVS One. Oh okay. Um, Black Russians. Okay. And I also was very like I, I remember being there and dancing to the song. Yeah. And. and thinking, wow, this is such a different experience. I mean, whoever's listening, like, you know, listen to the song. It's a mm -hmm. good one. A lot of chords, a lot of, like, uh, different textures to music that I've never been exposed to. Mm -hmm. And um, from there, I said, man, this is, you know, maybe I could try this or I could explore this, this genre of music more. Yeah. So then when I, when I ended up getting uh, my first DJ board, I... I dug and dug and dug and try to find music that fit that like sound I was looking for at the time and um, you know I kept on practicing uh, in 2020 uh, obviously we were struck with the pandemic so yeah. I had quite a bit of off time um, when I wasn't in school and I wasn't working mm -hmm. and I really got to kind of hone in and, and figure out you know how to DJ at, at a more advanced level and build my music so that's kind of where it all started. Mm -hmm. So you would say that like that kind of like you could pinpoint that to kind of being uh, the set um, and the experience that kind of like helped you take it more seriously, you would say? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I was toying with the idea, but after that, I was like, wow, you know, this genre is, is amazing. And when you first got your board, uh, were you already thinking about doing electronic or were you kind of just thinking about like playing whatever at that point? A bit of whatever, but okay. but I, I did find like that the focus would would be on like electronic music. Yeah, especially to begin with, it's a lot easier. I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. So then you kind of you started off um, discovering stuff, and you kind of, from what it sounds like, you kind of had like this. Uh, the Black Russians by DVS One was kind of like your your North Star. That was like kind of like the song that started it all. So were you kind of like exploring for more like techno, more house? Drum and bass. What was kind of like the vibes that you were going for? Um, it was a lot of house at first. Okay. I would say, 
because the you know the sounds of house really resonate with like older cuts of like funk and, yeah. and disco. Yeah. So some of the older tracks I listened to growing up, I would see them kind of reappear in house songs as like samples and mm -hmm. just with different takes on them. Yeah. But but that was my first kind of like uh, genre I really fell in love with when it came came to electronic music was was house. Yeah. Well, what kind of like specific house, like uh, maybe some artists or some genres was like the stuff that you started discovering here? Like, oh, like, you know, like I do want to keep searching in for more and more and more kind of like that. I would say a more of like Chicago style house. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as time periods, like anything like, like 90s, early 2000s house is okay. what, what I really started really falling in love with and uh, started to kind of form my sound that I play now around. Mm -hmm. And how would you say that kind of like the music that you were finding um, when you were younger, when you were like in middle school, all the hip hop and stuff like that, how would you say that that's kind of like tied into the music that you're kind of finding at that time? Well, well, now, I mean, I've gotten the opportunity to place, you know, at some bars and clubs that will allow me to kind of have more of an open format set or, or have mm -hmm. fun with it. You know, I'll play yeah. house. Like, for example, uh, when I play it over under, mm -hmm. um, I'll start off playing, you know, mostly house and funk and, and kind of um, end up progressing to like playing Detroit techno and, and Miami bass and different nice. genres. And, and that's what, like, I, I really appreciate about the art of DJing, that, you know, you could take it, um, you know, anywhere you really want, yeah. depending on the, the time and place. But, but there's venues and, and spaces that really allow you to play your sound without any type of limitation. So I would say um, that's kind of where I've been able to bring back some of the songs and stuff that I've loved listening to growing up mm -hmm. in a more, um, you know, uh, setting that allows me to share this with people. Yeah, no, it's definitely like it's one of the very unique things about your sets. Um, if you guys have not been able to see a set live, um, especially in places like Over Under and stuff like that, where you can go wherever you want. Um, you know, Chaos is a master at taking you on a journey um, from start to beginning. And it's thank not you, there's going to be one genre. And especially for me, I feel like that is kind of like um, like a style and a skill that kind of goes unnoticed or unappreciated nowadays. I feel like a lot of places, they kind of want you to stick with one thing. And obviously that, that's okay, especially for a night where it's a lineup, you know, and you got you got the whole lineup, so you have to be playing a certain thing. But when you can do your own thing, um, it's a different kind of skill. And I feel like you specifically have mastered that, you know, the way that you can, you can go um, wherever you want. You can kind of take the dance floor wherever you want and everybody's receptive to it. So just gotta give you your flowers because it's a very, very hard thing to do. Oh, thank you, man. I really try to have fun with it. And, and it's, it's amazing there's places that allow you to do that. Um, I'm gonna give a shout out to the Boombox because mm -hmm. I would say uh, when I started DJing you know, at, at clubs and, and bars and you know, having actual gigs, um, the first gig that I had that really opened my eyes up to, to that actually, to playing whatever you know you really wanted to or, mm -hmm. or having no type of expectation from from the bar or club to play a certain sound what was at the boombox mm -hmm. uh, i remember getting booked there for the first time and i think it was 2020 or early 2021 okay like i think it was actually just De december or january of 2021 got you and um many of you that may not know the or or new know the boombox is, yeah. is like a warehouse venue in uh, on on Bird Road, like uh, mm -hmm. near FIU type area, um, and it's 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 very unique, and I had never been there. Yeah. Um, so I, I got to play there for the first time, and it was very eye opening to to be in that environment, like you know, hearing stories about how how raves in, in cities like Detroit and Chicago were thrown and and warehouses and yeah. you know the lights were dim and and. Uh, you know the the DJ booth was separated from the from the people to to add you know to to just the fact that these spaces and and these parties and these events are really meant for people to to go in there dance not have a worry or care in the world and and just express themselves how they want to be expressed um, open my eyes so the the first time I played there um, the the DJ booth is upstairs so it's it's a yeah. warehouse. Uh, the dance floor is on the lower floor, and there's like a um, a small like upstairs area 
uh, with like it's almost like a balcony, mm -hmm. and the DJ booth set uh, set, set up there at that time, and um, you know I really fell in love with having that kind of control on the dance floor, like to the dance floor, and like mm -hmm. having the ability to view the people dancing, view the crowd, and uh, and play whatever I wanted to play. Like I, I played house, techno, electro, whatever I wanted to play, I played it, and I got to see. Um, the reactions from from the people dancing and and I was hooked on that kind of format or that ability to express you know whatever I wanted to play in a in a venue nice and what were what were kind of like uh what was like your journey going from learning at home you know especially like during the pandemic it was a lot of time just by yourself kind of learning and exploring and then what was like your journey going from that into playing out you you mentioned boombox is like one of the early first places um so we're like, what are some of like the first places that you were able to like play at for the first time? The first time I got booked to play at an actual club um, was in 2020, and it was at Treehouse. Oh, nice. Um, so uh, a buddy of mine from high school, his dad, uh, Rodrigo Vieira, shout out Rodrigo, shout out. Uh, big Brazilian DJ. Yeah. Um, be, some of my friends, we, we would go and see him play. Okay. And... Um, he has a very unique sound, very uh, centered towards house and dance music. Mm -hmm. And um, we would go to Treehouse to see him play. And, um, you know, at that time I was learning how to DJ and I was, you know, kind of more prone to going out and exploring the club scene and really, you know, being exposed to that area or that space. Yeah. And, um, you know, we would go see him and see him and see him. And then I remember one day... Um, some of my friends, like, they knew I was DJing. Like, I would bring the, the decks over to, to their house and, mm -hmm. like, I, you know, very, like, n nonchalant. Like, we, we'd throw some, some parties or, like, house parties and whatnot, and they said, yeah. oh, well, uh, you know, come, you know, DJ for us. And, and they knew that I liked doing it, and they knew that um, at that time, you know, I had some skill behind it. So I remember going to one of these parties, and um, uh, Rodrigo was playing, and, and his uh, uh, another DJ... Uh, Rod B, they, they DJ sometimes as a duo, but they're both Brazilian DJs, very big nice. um, in Brazil and very big here in Miami. Mm -hmm. um, my friends approached, you know, Rodrigo, and they're like, oh, like, you know, uh, he knows how to DJ, he's really good <laughs> at DJing. You got to get him here. Come on, do it, do it. Some and good then, friends like, right there. Um, yeah, they're really supportive, appreciate <laughs> them. And then I remember um, I talked to Rod B a bit more, and, uh, you know, he actually he was like, oh, you know, man, like, you know, um, we're looking, you know, to, to add, you know, more DJs to our rosters. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they threw parties, like, on a monthly basis. Okay. And um, uh, Rodrigo's son, Rafa, uh -huh. he also DJed um, as well. And, and they were like, oh, you know, we, we want to find someone to play with Rafa for a set. And uh, that was, you know, that was, he's like, oh, send me a mix or whatnot. I sent them a mix, and, and then they, they booked me to play, you know, my first, uh, I guess, actual club gig. Nice. Yeah, so I played with Rafa. It was um, kind of during, it was a weird time. It was during the pandemic, yeah. kind of. So, like, stuff was open. It wasn't open. Like, I think Treehouse at that time operated from 6 p.m. to 12 a.m. Okay. So it was very, or it was very weird. Yeah. And I, they gave us, like, an opening slot from 6 to 7.30. Okay. But, um... I told all of my friends, I was like, oh, man, it's my first time playing at a club, man. Come on, you got to come through. It's going to be a good time. And, and nice. we brought a lot of people uh, to come and watch us play at, like, 6 p.m. Love that. While the sun was still out. Yeah. Um, inside a club. And it, it, was, it was very yeah, eye-opening to see all people that were, like, supportive. And from there, um, I, I kept on getting booked with them. Um, I kept on trying to, you know, branch out, um, mm -hmm. find different venues, uh, different kind of like events that offered, you know, like you know, they had DJs and, um, yeah, from there I think I, I played a lot of uh, Treehouse's parties uh, and some of the bookers that would book Treehouse outside of Rodrigo and Rod B booked me a few times. Nice. Um, I played at a market, uh, Truck Town Market. Okay. Um, that was like where I met someone that worked with the boombox and, and, okay. you know, from there kind of like the, you know, stuff, stuff started lining up. I, I showed face. I went to parties without any expectations. You know, I started mm -hmm. this with no expectations, just, um, 
for the sake of having fun and wanting to express myself. And, um, you know, uh, stuff moved on. Uh, I kept on, you know, getting gigs here and there. And, and right now, I'm very happy to, to still be part of the scene and, and get booked slightly more often or, or yeah. whatnot. Um, but no, it's been a very uh, good few years. Nice. And you definitely have na- made a name for yourself in that side. And actually speaking on your name, your name Chaos didn't actually originally come as a DJ name, right? Yes. So a fun fact, um, I am not, uh, I would say, a chaotic person. <laughs> so Chaos is kind of an oxymoron when it comes to, to people you know, who know me personally. You know, I'm, 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 pretty, I'm a pretty chill guy. I can attest to that. But... Um, Chaos started actually in, in 2017. It wow. started as a clothing brand. Okay. Um, that was another one of my passions or, or kind of like, you know, passion projects, you could say, or stuff mm-hmm. that I always wanted to do. Um, I was heavily into, into streetwear. I, I love design and, and kind, of, um, kind of putting something out there. So mm-hmm. in 2017, I, I came, you know, I, had, I was fascinated by the fact that, you know, like, I really want to start something. I want to start like you know making shirts. Um, so there was a, a book that I had seen the title of. I read a bit of it. It's like more oriented towards business okay. called um, Thriving on Chaos. Oh. And I, I don't know what it was or what the word or it just stood out to me, the, yeah. the word chaos. And I was like, oh man, this is super cool. Um, and then like, I played with the idea of, all right, chaos, we're going to make it all caps, like how MF Doom's name is. Nice. We're going to add an exclamation point, and this is going to be, you know, a brand, the next Love big that. thing. <laughs> and I made a design uh, for a shirt uh, called the OGT. Some people still have it. Nice. Um, it's, it's like a pyramid with different colors and stuff like that. And um, that's how chaos started. A um, bunch of my friends, you know, I made like 50 shirts or 40 shirts, and I would just basically I give them out to people and, yeah. and people liked it. They liked the design. They, they wore it. Um, but um, I, I wanted to put more time into it. But at the same time, I was going to school. I was working so that I didn't really have the, the means to, to branch out with it and you know, make more shirts. So it's something that uh, after I made my first shirt in 2017, I kind of mm-hmm. like put it to the side. and I didn't really touch it until... <sighs> Yeah, like 20, um, end of 2018, 2019 is, okay. is when, I, when I started DJing, or when I started learning how to DJ, I, yeah. I was like, oh man, I, I need a, a name. Yeah. And I thought it would be you know, better than just bringing back Chaos as yeah. uh, the name for it. So that's how that name stuck. Okay, nice. And you, you kind of, along that, those lines, you eventually picked it back up in terms of the clothing brand and all that, right? Yeah, so I, I made a, another collection in, uh, I think, yeah, it was like 2021 or 2022. Okay. Of, um, I believe it was uh, two shirts with designs. Uh, one of them was the Unseen T. It paid homage to uh, Quasimodo's nice. album. Uh, the other one was uh, the Feel Chaos T. It was like an abstract design of like, like almost two hands touching, yeah. Have that one. And then and then two very basic, like just straight up, uh, like chaos font, like mm-hmm. tees. Um, some yeah, th- that was like the the last drop I had, and um, I'm you know uh, I'm cooking some stuff up. There I you definitely go. now exclusive have have more um, means and availability to to start it back up. So yeah, you guys are hearing your first. Uh, <laughs> I'm cooking up something fire. There you go. Common Unity exclusive right there. And I got to say, um, no bias, like those those designs that you had were really, really cool. Um, and also the fact that you made other stuff, such as uh, the tote that I actually use, I'm using right now. Um, you have like a lot of really cool designs, and I'm definitely very excited to see what you got cooking up there, huh? Thanks, man. I'm, that's funny. Like, I think I don't, I don't even have that tote bag. You know, it's <laughs> like pe- people have it. I don't. It's on the back <laughs> to you if you want. <laughs> no, no, it's all $100. Yours. Uh, yeah. But that, no, I mean, I do love how it kind of, you know, you started off like with a brand um, and tied it into your own personal thing as as like the DJ as well. And it kind of helps build both a little bit. You know, you kind of have both that combine into this one thing, um, this one thing that's like bigger than just you. Um, 
And to me personally, like it, it's it's like the perfect merger because you got um, you're able to show your fashion, your sense in that, um, which is like a whole other side of you um, that most people probably wouldn't really know um, or see. That's obviously because of what you're wearing, but the fact that you're yeah. also a designer, thank you know, you, that's that's not that's not an easy thing to just kind of just do um, on a whim. Um, so being able to tie those two um, in terms of the fashion and yourself as a person and as a DJ, I think is perfect. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of when you started DJing, um, you you said you obviously we talked about. Um, how you started off with Treehouse and um, with Boombox, uh, which I guess you would consider yourself like a resident of Boombox? Yeah, I played there uh, pretty frequently um, like while they were still open. I know they're under like, you know, renovations and are yep. planning to open back up, but that was one of the, the places I held a, I would say, residency in. I played very frequently at uh, Eagle Room. Mm -hmm. That's another very fun room uh, on the beach that, that was um, let me explore different, you know, my different uh, interpretations of what that room called for. So it was a lot of a, a lot of old school house, like yeah. a lot of fun music. Um, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to play um, at Three Points. Mm -hmm. I, I've played I played there for the first time in 2021, and then um, subsequently the last uh, what's it, what two two three years. Um, I've gotten the opportunity to play at uh, Floyd twice. Uh, one was uh, f opening up for Will Buck and Felipe Gordon, nice. which was pff, one of the, like, the top three DJ experiences I've had, and, like having that exposure to that room, which was so um, inspiring like, to me in the, in the beginning of, of like, you know, my exposure to, to club, to the club scene. I bet. And then for the second time was uh, for Adam at the door. Shout out Adam's uh, discretion okay. party. Yeah. So th those are you know very fond uh, memories I have. And um, yeah, you know, f recently you know I've been um, kind of holding like a you know, every other month type thing at over under um, here and there. You know, Eagle Room and and. Um, my my most recent endeavor, I would say, has been uh, my launch and start of uh, of my own party series called Deja Vu. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, it's been going on for for two months. Nice. My my first uh, party was in June. Uh, uh, Zay Zay is is very uh, shout out Zay Zay. They're the ones that have allowed me to to use their indoor uh, space to mm -hmm. to host these events and. Um, I'm, I'm very excited for, for what the future holds for that. You know, the first two parties, in my opinion, were uh, good starts. You yeah. know, I booked uh, str strictly, you know, Miami, Miami talent. Um, Tigo, you were part of the first two. You know, we played back-to-back, <laughs> yes. -back, which was very fun. Honor. Um, for the first party, it was, it was me and Contigo, Lewis, back-to-back. -back, and then we had uh, Milo Zero and, and Fifi, mm -hmm. uh, Phoenix, Alyssa. You know, they, they played. They were part of it. Uh, the second one was uh, once again we played back to back, yes. and then it was uh, Adam at the door and Sarah Fitz. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I really like that aspect of, of, or I really, you know, my I guess my latest fascination is is this, you know, throwing events, mm -hmm. having the ability to to, to book talent, um, having the ability to really kind of portray the night as as what you want it to be, have your uh, creative exposure with working with different artists to create the flyer and, and really control, you know, what you want the party to be. So um, that's something I really am looking forward to, to grow and I have uh, you know, big plans to, for it in the future. Nice. And yeah, I mean, that's been uh, something really cool to see kind of grow. Um, Deja Vu has been, uh, I think, something that the scene has kind of needed. Um, a lot of people, they kind of start stuff and they're very much oriented with um, bringing in big names. And I think that, that's also a wonderful thing. You know, there's a lot of talent out there in the world that um, should be spread around, um, especially here in Miami, where it's, it's, we're lucky enough to have um, these venues and these places that are open to having um, people from, from the outside come in, because um, not a lot of places in the world do that. But with that being said, I think what's more important, in my opinion, is kind of shining a spotlight on the um the local scene 
And I think that Deja Vu has been just what the scene needs. Um, it's been a lot of local artists, some that um, play more frequently than others and others that don't, um, and give like this, this spotlight on the scene because it's a very unique scene that I think deserves its praise. Um, but with that being said, how did the idea of um, Deja Vu come to be? Where is like that from? So I kind of toyed around with the idea of it at Over Under. Okay. Um, a, maybe like yeah, six, seven, eight months ago. Okay. It was like the first um, iteration I had of it. You know, the the name Deja Vu, you know, or the word Deja Vu is basically mm -hmm. that sense of like, familiarity that someone has with a moment or an experience. Like it seems like they've 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 been there before, and um, I don't know. I, I kind of like get attached to words, like how chaos was something that attached to me. Like yeah. deja vu was a word that like stuck with me um, very much. So, so when the idea popped in my head, or like you know that kind of uh, motivation to say, hey, let me let me start getting more involved in in the sense or in the space where where you know. I'm in control of throwing an event. Um, Deja Vu stuck with me. Mm. And uh, the, the kind of like the, the ethos and the theme behind the, the party is, is basically that um, I want people to feel like they've been there before, in a sense. Um, but also, I, I want to give the, the DJ or the artist that's booked to like have their own interpretation of the sound they want to share. Like, I, mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know you play what you want to play mm -hmm. and, and give them the, the creative freedom to, to just um, build the night how they want to build it. Yeah. And, and that's kind of w what my idea behind it is. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I shout out to Zay, Zay because honestly, it's been wonderful to see how receptive um, and welcoming they've been to something like that. Um, you know, they've, they've been very, very kind um, and generous to you from what I've, I've seen and heard. Um, in, in letting you ho ho host this like monthly event um, you know and it, especially because it's very much like a, a risk because um, you know like I said earlier you're not bringing in like talent from the outside and that's kind of like what I feel like a lot of venues are looking for or, or for big names um, whether it be from the outside or not but you're really shining a spotlight on, on these artists you know like the people you've had so far um, like you mentioned that don't normally get, wouldn't normally get to, to play like a closing set like that for the most part, um, or have a night for them. And also they, they could play their own thing, right? Cause you know. Definitely. Yeah, like most places like they're, they're, they're a little more strict on, on what you're gonna be able to play. Um, but I think that honestly, especially right now, it's kind of like a match made in heaven. Um, they have a lot of faith in you um, and you've, from what I've seen, have been de delivering, you know? No, oh, definitely. I mean, they're they're very um, welcoming, and and they, um, you know, at the time we're we're looking to find someone to partner with for for these kind of like Thursday types of events where mm -hmm. where it's a bit harder to to push. But you know, mm -hmm. Miami's a city that doesn't really sleep, so it's true. People do like going out on Thursdays, Wednesdays, or you know, every day of the week. But um, no, um, they they've been good, and and I've been trying to really be extremely. You know, diligent and professional and, and just really trying to, uh, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. And I know exactly. starting a party isn't something that can necessarily pop off in the first go around. Yeah. But um, I'm very goal oriented and I'm very focused to take this one party at a time and, and just give it my all and, and see where it grows yeah. um, in the next year, uh, two years plus. Uh, where do you kind of see it going? Well, what is your, your long term goals with it? Because um, I do think that it has a lot of potential, for sure. Man, I mean, right now I'm just focusing on trying to bring artists that, that, that I like in Miami or that you know, people enjoy and just giving them the opportunity to, to play at, at a venue. Um, maybe giving them that slot time that gives them you know, control of the dance floor or whatnot. Um, ideally, I just want to you know, keep it like that, you know, keep on booking artists in Miami, maybe collaborate with other uh, event thrower organizers and throwers yeah. and, and you know do something together and, and, and see what we could come up with as far as a lineup and uh, you know obviously uh, you know, 
there's there's um, outside talent that I would love to book, and and that would be a big um, kind of goal of mine to to maybe bring in an artist that that um, hasn't yet been to Miami or or hasn't fre- been in Miami recently, and mm-hmm. and kind of toy with that idea of of having someone come in play with support or you know Miami artists being mm-hmm. the 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 main backbone behind it. Yeah. But um, like I said, man, you know, one step at a time. Um, really plan planning things out and and just uh trying to give it my all is, yeah. is right now what the focus is i think i i mean seeing um like organizers such as like um, unmute of course you know unmute was uh it started off small as well um, and seeing to kind of like the behemoth it's kind of grown to right now and is still growing to you know um they're throwing stuff all over the world um shout out to unmute but i feel like they kind of inspired a lot of event organizers to see that it is possible here in Miami. I think that there's a lot of um, uncertainty on kind of, you know, like if this uh, David versus Goliath kind of thing can can work um, because there's so many large corporations that, you know, it's it's hard to compete um, with local talent compared to to these places that are bringing in big names. Um, And obviously, um, like there's no nothing against that because we get to have these people come into the community. and kind of see what Miami is uh, from somewhere else. And without that, that we wouldn't have a local scene. Um, but I think that they really gave uh, the idea in a lot of people's minds that this is possible. Um, you know, and I, I honestly think um, Deja Vu, along with a lot of other recent um, parties that have been getting made, have the potential to go the distance. Uh, and I think that, you know, a lot of people like, the organizers such as yourself that have this mind and this goal um, to take it where it is instead of just like throwing parties uh, month after month with no direction. Um, I think that it's going to help this this scene for the foreseeable future for sure. Oh, definitely, man. I think that's a big thing. And I think people, different organizers working together is going to be also a big thing. You know, Agreed. Um, joining forces and kind of... Um, putting resources together to, to come up with a lineup and, and bring different, you know, audiences that a party caters to together is, is something that's really important. And um, I think it'll definitely help the scene, you know, if, if people are able to collaborate more and mm-hmm. kind of uh, create these events that are tailored towards different crowds, but, you know, letting them kind of divulge and mix together just to, you know, see what the experience is like is uh, something that I see as, as a good um kind of outlet for, for different creatives here in Miami. Um, like you mentioned, like Miami is such a wonderful city with yeah. so many people that appreciate um, you know, going out and, and like having a good time. Um, and I think it's just going to you know, continue to grow. Um, I think Miami, it's safe to say that they're one of the, um, I guess, electronic music kind of uh, cities that have established a good name for themselves when it comes to electronic uh, and dance music. And, you know, Indeed. it's just going to keep on growing from there. Yeah, 100%. I think it, there's there's so much potential in this city. Um, and I love that you're taking a focus on, on collaboration because there are a lot of wonderful organizations um, and groups that have started to come um, and have, that have even been established for a long time here. There's so many cool, um, unique groups, sounds, uh, everything. Like you have a little bit of everything here, and I think that's w- one of the things that makes Miami very unique, for sure. Um, lots of places around the world to have um, some some sounds that you can um, kind of like pull from and, and see in their inspirations. But Miami definitely is kind of like a, a melting pot for everything, so it's a very unique thing. And I love, like I said, that you're you're doing a collaborative collaboratively because I do think that the future is collaboration overall. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I love hearing more about Deja Vu and, and everything behind it. I think that it does have the potential to go the, to go to the distance. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely excited to see more of it. And when is the, the next one? Hey man, you guys, you guys are gonna hear it first, um, August 22nd. There you go. I'm gonna announce it tomorrow. Um, but basically, it's it's Deja Boom. Nice. It's going to be a Deja Vu and Boombox collaboration. Damn, full circle. Yeah, I'm very excited for this one. The The lineup is 
quite spicy. I bet. Um, I'll share it with you guys. Cause, cause, um, yeah? All right. Uh, so it's going to be um, myself, okay. uh, 619. Nice. Uh, Duality. Okay. Uh, Mango. Nice. Mr. Low. Uh-huh. And uh, Winter Wrong. Wow. So You heard it here first. I'm what a lineup. Very, very, Damn. very, very excited for this one. Um, it's like, a, like you said, a first full circle moment getting yeah. to work with uh, with Ricky, with Laz, with Miguel, um, uh-huh. on a on a project together, and um, I'm very excited to, to to for this one just because uh, of the sound. It's gonna you know obviously <laughs> Boombox has their sound and it's yeah. gonna be um, you know bringing that to to Zay Zay is gonna be very fun. Damn, that's gonna be really cool. But um, yeah, August 22nd, Thursday, 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. Come early, stay late. That's the motto, um, and that's that's gonna be uh, one for the books. I mean, yeah. If you're looking for one of the most unique and most fun parties that you can find this year, I think you got it right there. August twenty second. That sounds like one hell of a time, honestly. Oh, um, yeah, brother. I'm sad I won't be there for it, but that that sounds crazy. Man, also shout out Lewis. Uh, as many may not know, he he's he's moving to to Spain, yes. and I just want to give my thanks to him for being an amazing friend and amazing uh, back-to-back partner, the parties, <laughs> parties we've, we've, we've gone to spin at. Um, I want to wish best of luck to him in, in uh, Madrid. Thank you. Because you know, he's definitely going to make a name for himself over there uh, while Thank he's you. there. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's definitely hard to leave stuff like this behind, and especially my, my all-time favorite back-to-back partner for sure. Um, There's nothing like the sets that we create sometimes, but um, yeah, it's bittersweet. Um, But you know, uh, with that being said, uh, I definitely want to tie it back a little bit. um, And I want to finish it off with a question that I like to ask um, my my interviewees. um, And that's what are kind of like your five most influential albums of all time? You know? It's a tough question, yeah. but I guess thinking about it, um, I mentioned one of them, 1999 by Joy Badass, is definitely something that I um, stuck with me a very long time, and I still listen to it. Um, Solid. Uh, um Food by MF Doom. Fire. That's uh, another one that I, I can listen to on repeat, uh, lots of samples used, lots of unique takes on, on, on rap and, and hip hop music. Um, Salad Days by Mac DeMarco. Love it. That's one that, you know, I, I could, just listening to it, I'll have flashbacks of like waking up early and going to school and, and you just, you know, I think through music, one really relives moments in their life. Like I'll, I'll listen to a song and I'll remember like the time period, like the, like what I was doing or, or like there's different memories, you know, like you listen to a song and for me at least, like I'll, I'll go back in time and I'll remember what I was doing, like who my friends, who my friends were at the time, like what age I was, like different, like, you know, if it's like a Spanish song, I'll like think about, oh man, we, we listened to this at like a barbecue, like I'm smelling the food we had at the barbecue. Yeah. So it's very, uh, music, something that's very special Yeah. Uh, for a lot of people and, 100%. Giving them like that nostalgic and ability to just relive memories. Um, another album that's I would say very I guess special or something that I really love was a uh, Nature of Evil by Psychic Mirrors. Yes. That's something that um, I think came out in 2016. I didn't find it out until maybe like 2019. Okay. But man, that's been a go-to. Like every song there, start to finish, is amazing. Miami Legends. Miami Legends exactly and I I rotate their music in a lot of my sets so yeah. it's it's a good one and then the fifth one um let me see thinking I could say um I want to say um I can't remember the album right now okay um but it's from Los Iracundos okay they're uh Uruguayan kind of like like rockish like very like 80s type of 
of Steez. Mm -hmm. Very good band. Um, all their work is good. I have quite of their, uh, got their vi like a lot of their vinyls and some of their greatest hits, but uh, music that really resonates with me and kind of helps me like, you know, chill out and also like remember like, you know, some of my like Hispanic culture. It's music that I've played to, you know, to my mom and she was like, oh, how do you know this? <laughs> you know, she said like, oh, like, like, what do you know about this? And I was like, man, yeah. I know about it. I love that. And, um, yeah, I see those are my top top five. Nice, cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chaos, uh, for coming on. Uh, where can the people at home find you? Man, um, I have an Instagram at Chaos underscore Miami. You go. Um, you know, you'll see me around and just say hi. I'm I'm a friendly guy. There you go. Um, and that being said, uh, thank you so much, everybody at home for watching. Everybody at MCR. Um, for supporting me through this. Um, it's the final episode of Common Unity, and as he said, I'm going to be moving to, to Madrid um, on August 21st. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for supporting me through all of this, everybody, um, you specifically, Chaos. Thank you so much for, for always treating me like a friend and welcoming me from the first day that I met you. And everybody at MCR, Nick, Phil, Mauricio, et cetera, et cetera, thank you guys so much for giving me the opportunity. It does mean a lot. You guys helped me so much in my journey. Um, and everybody at home, this wouldn't be anything without you guys. You guys really do make this very special. I love everybody deeply from the bottom of my heart. Um, without you guys, I wouldn't be here where I am right now. And if you guys are ever in Madrid, please let me know, and I will show you guys around. And when I come back, I'll see you guys all here. Thank you so much. A lot of love. And uh, yeah, let's uh, take it to the DJ decks and go spin some fire music. Shout out Lewis. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chaos. <laughs>